Amen. Tonight, we are teaching on the doctrine of music. This is one of the most controversial subjects in the church world, so I'm going to tackle it tonight. And I'd like to teach on it from uh, based on what the Bible says about music. And I'll, I'll go ahead and say that uh, a lot of it really comes down to personal conviction. And so I will tell you tonight, it will not offend me if, if some people do not agree with everything that I think about music. I'm this perfectly okay. But tonight I want to talk about biblically the purpose in music. Uh, and, and we're going to cover a lot of passages tonight. So let, before we begin, let's just ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, God, that we sense and feel in this place tonight, Lord. God, I ask that you would anoint me to teach your word tonight, Lord. God, that you would stir up our hearts tonight, Lord, that you would bring us to a deeper realm of worship, Lord. Lord, that you would teach us how to enter into your presence. As the disciples said, teach us how to pray. Lord, we ask that you would teach us how to truly worship you, Lord. Lord, open up the eyes of our understanding that we might see what you want us to see tonight. And Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. amen. I believe that all of the music that is on the face of this earth could really be broken up into three different categories. Number one, you've got music that is inspired by the Spirit of God. Number two, you got music that is basically just made up of the flesh. And then number three, you have music that is really backed by the enemy. Now, when we're listening to music, really any music we should listen to, we should really ask the question, is this music that we're listening to a reflection of God or is it a reflection of the world? Is it building up our flesh or is it building up our spirit? Is it, is it truly worship or is it just loud noise and a, and a bunch of hype? Now, there's really three important elements uh, of music and, and for uh, actual musicians, they actually give seven different elements of music, but for our, for the sake of our teaching tonight, I want to give you three elements of music. Number one, you got the message. Number two, you got the melody. And number three, you got the messenger. You got the, the, the message, the melody, and the messenger. Really, with any song, you got those three components. You have the words, you have the instrumentals behind the words, and then you have the individuals who are playing the music. Now, when it comes to worship music, I believe in both horizontal worship music and vertical worship music. What do I mean by that? I believe that certain worship music uh, that was written is really imp uh, intended to reach people, whereas vertical uh, worship music is intended to reach God. You got music that is intended to reach out to others, and then you got other worship music that is for you personally to, to attach your spirit to the spirit spirit of God. And the most important question when it comes to music in the church is not what's going to make everybody happy, but really it's what's going to stir up hearts and draw people closer to the Lord. Uh, there's some people who think, thus saith the Lord, you have to sing Southern Gospel. Uh, thus saith the Lord, you have to sing out of uh, uh, hymnal books, which, by the way, if, if uh, some of the politicians in our nation, if they had their way in the church, we couldn't just sing hymns. You'd have to sing hymns and hers, but be that as it may. Now, I I'm still blessed by some older songs and, and even hymns, but... I think that they should be ones that are relatable and sung in a way that touches hearts and makes a difference in the lives of people. I believe that worship should uh, strive for excellence while at the same time uh, prioritizing sensitivity and direction from the Holy Spirit. You know, there, there's a lot of um, music uh, groups and a lot of churches where they actually, they got, they got earpieces and they got somebody in the back telling, uh, telling them where to go. Uh, go to verse two. Go to the bridge. Go to the go to the chorus, and and that might be okay if that person is being led by the Spirit of God. But I believe that even in worship, you've got to be led by the Spirit of God because God might just have you on one chorus singing it over and over and over again, and God's moving on the upon the hearts, and God is touching lives, and and so even though you strive for excellence, you got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I think that. There is a danger of, of be, becoming so focused on uh, professionalism. There, there's a lot of music that 
for me, it just all sounds the same. It's just busyness, and I don't really sense the anointing. It's hard for me to flip in through Christian radio stations to find worship music that, that truly blesses me. There should be sensitivity uh, to the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, I told you on Sunday, I, I would answer the question, is God Southern Gospel or is he contemporary? Does anyone know the answer to that question? Is he Southern Gospel or is he contemporary? The answer tonight is neither. God is God all by himself. God doesn't need us to, to confine him within our own parameters. I, I don't think that God has a favorite genre uh, of music. I believe that God, he uses people from different genres of music and, and different cultures and people that are truly worshiping God and, and worshiping in reverence and worshiping in awe. And the spirit of God will move upon those hearts and he will use it to bless other people. Hallelujah. Now, personally, I am not a country person. When music, when it gets too twangy, you lose me. And I have the tendency, personally, to lean toward a lot of newer uh, worship music. Really, you could probably say mostly newer uh, worship music. But, you know, I, I've been to many different countries. I've seen a lot of different cultures. Uh, I've seen the, the Hispanic culture. I've seen the Russian culture. I've seen the European culture. I've seen the African culture. Uh, I've seen the, the Cuban culture. All of their worship is distinctively different in their style, in their songs, in their uh, expressions or lack thereof. But what really matters is are they truly worshiping Jesus from the heart? Are they truly worshiping God? Is it true, sincere worship? Because if they're truly worshiping the Lord, I'm all for it. Hallelujah. You know, I remember the first time I went to Vienna, Austria, and was in the largest Romanian church. They have a huge Romanian culture, of course, being right near Romania. And so this was a Romanian church of probably about 1,500 people. First night I got there, and I remember walking in the service, and, and, and you know, there was no expression, and their hands weren't lifted, and guys were on one side, women were on the other side. I, at first, I thought the church was just dead spiritually. But then when I put on the headphones and they had translation into English, I began to feel the spirit of God. And I re realized this was a spirit-filled church, and they believed in the, in the power of God. Different culture didn't have the same expression, but they had the spirit of God. And they were worshiping from the heart. Hallelujah. <laughs> A lot of Russian churches, when you go to the Ru Russian churches, you won't see a whole lot of clapping. You won't see dancing. You won't see jumping around. But when you have the altar call, most Russian churches you go to, when you have altar calls, just about every person comes down to the front and begins to cry out to God, praying in that heavenly prayer language, seeking the face of God. Amen. And so there's different cultures, there's different styles, there's different genres. Now, A.W. Tozer, he once said, worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ that is within us. Again, worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us more than the Christ that is within us. Now, I, I believe the most important question to ask with any song that we listen to is, is it anointed by the Holy Spirit? Because if it's anointed by the Holy Spirit, then that is God's stamp of approval. And I like to think of it like this. If it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. If it's anointed by the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God is upon it, it's good enough for me. It's good enough for this church. No matter who sung it, uh, what their moms, brothers, cousins, daughters, boyfriend did 20 years ago, I, I don't care about any of that. Does it bless people and draw them closer to Jesus Christ? Is it stirring up hearts? Hearts. Is it bringing people closer to Jesus? That's all I care about. Hallelujah. I believe that there is a place at times for older songs and hymns. However, I believe that this generation that they often connect with more simple worship music. Now, I, I want to say this, that when music is simple, that it does not mean that the music is quote-unquote seeker sensitive. And, and this is something that I, uh, a topic that I evolved on because I used to hear newer worship music looked at as quote-unquote seeker-sensitive or worldly. If it didn't have a whole chapter in the Bible uh, in the song, then, then they, it wasn't good enough for people. But, you know, I found that oftentimes simplicity is what draws people into the presence of God. You know, Luke 18, verse 17, it says this, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter into it. And so 
Jesus said that we ought to come to him with the faith of a child. That's, that's simplicity. You, do, you don't have to quote Genesis to Revelation uh, in a song uh, for it to be worshipped. Sometimes it's a, the simple songs like, let it rain and, and draw me, Lord, and hallelujah, that, that people begin to enter into worship. It's no longer something just in the head, but they are truly worshiping the Lord. They're truly worshiping God. Hallelujah. Uh, have you ever heard songs that are just so wordy that there's just no worship? People just reading songs off a page, and, and you know, there's no genuine worship. We talk about that as a worship team, that, that sometimes songs are too wordy, and sometimes we go without it because we don't want people just to, to, to be so caught up trying to understand uh, who Ebenezer is that they're not worshiping Jesus. And, and I found that and oftentimes the church world will sing songs, and, and most of the time people are half-heartedly singing them, and you can tell they don't even know what they're singing. They don't even understand the song. And, and, and Jesus doesn't need you to do all that for you to enter into his presence. Sometimes it's just singing about how much he loves you. Sometimes it's just crying out for God to send down the rain, and people begin to open up their hearts and open up their spirits, and the Spirit of God begins to flood their heart and flood their soul. That's what we want as a church. We want the Spirit of God to have his way. We want people to fall down on their knees and worship God for tears to flow down their face as the presence of God touches their heart and floods their soul. That's what we're after as a church. That's what the church should be after, the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, the Lord said, this people draw near with me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. And, you know, you have to wonder how many people walk into churches around the world, and they're worshiping God with their lips. They're singing along to the songs on the screens, and maybe they have hymnal books in their church. And they're reading the words, but their heart is far from them. And they're not truly, maybe they've never truly entered into worship. Can I tell you something here tonight? God, he wants more than your, your, your words. He wants more than your singing. He wants more than you just acquiescing to the truth. He wants your heart. He wants you to draw near unto him. He said, draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. Hallelujah. So music is a powerful tool that can be used for the good or it can be used for the bad. And I believe that as important as, a, as worship is, that worship is not a replacement for the word of God. You know, somebody said it. I thought it was interesting. They said there's a lot of people in, in the church world today that are worshiping worship instead of worshiping God. I believe that worship is critically important, but I don't believe that it's a replacement for the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And so I believe it's still God's ordained method for the preaching of the gospel. Amen. Now, there will be services at times where the Spirit of God moves and let me say this, that sometimes a song is a sermon with instrumentals behind it. I remember somebody I knew who attended the same Bible college, and, and he grew up in a Baptist background. And I, I remember having a conversation with him because it, it would bother him when we would have chapel services and the Spirit of God would move and there would be no preaching. We would just ha end up having a whole service of worship and praise. And, you know, I begin to ask him the question, is it possible that maybe because you've not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit that you don't sense and feel what everybody else is sensing and feeling? And he came to realize that he said, I believe that you're right. I believe that my perception has been off. Because sometimes the Spirit of God will move in worship, and, and, and there won't be any preaching. And sometimes, you know, like Pastor Torrance said recently, the Lord, he could have said, my house shall be called a house of preaching. But he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And so we ought to be a church that seeks the face of God. We ought to be a church that worship, worships God. And you can be singing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And somebody walk in the door who's bound by drugs and bound by cocaine and bound by heroin, and they hear that. 
that song and that truth has, has come to their ears and they reach out by faith and they're saved, they're born again just like that. Hallelujah. God, he can use music for souls to be saved, for people to be delivered, for people to be healed. Hallelujah. Now, many believe that, that Lucifer was the director of music in heaven, and, and really that's taken from Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 and 14, and there's some discrepancy over whether or not scripture is, uh, is clear that he was a leader of worship, but you see here the workmanship of your of your symbols and your and your pipes. And so many believe that that these verses here are in reference to Lucifer when he was an angel in heaven, being the director of worship. And, and I believe that the enemy, that he uses worship, he uses music to deceive people, to lead people away from God, to lead people away from Jesus Christ. I believe that, that music that is inspired by God will draw your heart closer to God and that it will prepare hearts to receive the word of God. <clears throat> And let me say this tonight, that if you only sing songs that are, are written by perfect people, then you're going to have to write your own songs. And by the time you get done writing your own song, that song is going to be disqualified because you're the one who wrote it. Amen? We're not looking for songs that were written by perfect people. In fact, many great anointed worship songs that we sing in the church world today, if you do an investigation, then you'll find out that they weren't perfect people. But I'm so thankful that God works in spite of us, not because of us. And if there's a hungry heart that is worshiping Jesus, then God can anoint that individual and use that individual to bless the church. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Hallelujah. And I hear a lot of people who write off any song that comes from a, a certain worship team because they don't uh, agree with every preacher of that ministry. But can I tell you something here tonight? God, he's so much bigger than all that. And, and, and you know, for all they know, that song could have been written by somebody who is in no way a part of that church. And it might have just been that church who made that song uh, popular. So we shouldn't get consumed with all of that. We shouldn't allow those things to prevent us from utilizing songs that are anointed anointed by the Spirit of God. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And one of the most important questions that you could ask in a church is, are you reaching the next generation? Are you reaching the next generation? I said it recently that if a church isn't reaching the youth, then they just become a retirement center. Are you reaching the youth? Are you reaching the next generation? I believe that there is a way to effectively reach this next generation for the cause of Christ without compromising the truth. I, I believe that there is a way to effectively reach this next generation. Well, bless God, we only sing this, that, and, and the other, okay? But do you have any youth? Because if you don't have any youth, then you're missing it. I believe that you can effectively reach reach the next generation without compromising the word of God. And, and you know, in leadership, you can't make excuses for yourself. You are the one that has to lead the church into healthy change. You might be criticized. You might get written off. You might get called worldly, fleshly, or contemporary simply because you sing newer songs, but it's not your responsibility to convince your critics. It's your responsibility to reach the lost generation that is before you. It is your responsibility to reach the next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's your responsibility. As a leader, you are the one that creates the change. You are the one that, that leads the people of God into the next season. You, you know, uh, evangelist Jason Stidham, he preached a great message this last Sunday night. And he was talking about the transition that's happening in the church world. And, and there's always a transition that's happening. And how we, how we handle that transition is critically important. How you lead in that transition is critically important. There is a generation that is lost, that is broken, that is hurting. There is a generation that the enemy is after. The devil has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And we as a church have to do what we got to do to reach this next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, take a praise break, and I'll keep on preaching tonight. We have to do what we have to do. 
I said it before, as a leader, you are a CPS. You are a chief problem solver. Amen? Amen. CPS. And you know what I found is that oftentimes when one's church is struggling that the leader will blame it on the people. Well, the people don't want to hear the truth. Well, the people aren't committed. The people, I don't want to shame people into coming to church. I don't want to shame people. I, I don't have to shame people for people to come to church. I want to do church in a way that touches hearts and touches lives or people sense and feel the spirit of God and they want to come to church. I don't want them to come to church because they feel like they have to come to church. I want them to come to church because they need a fresh touch from the Spirit of God. I want them to come to church because they are hungry for the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I don't want to twist your arm and coerce you and show up to your doorstep. How come you, you ain't been coming to church? I want the Spirit of God to draw you to church. I, I, I want us to be giving the people something that's worth the drive. I, I want to begin. I want to take the responsibility. I, I want to do what I got to do in order to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what you got to do. Hallelujah. God said this. He said, behold, I do a new thing. And in, in order for us to embrace what God is doing now, sometimes we have to let go of certain things of the past. Now, what does contemporary mean? Contemporary it just simply means modern or current. That's all contemporary means. Contemporary, it just simply means modern or current. You've got some, some new music uh, that is good, and then you've got some that might not be any different from what you hear out in the world. But I want to say this, that contemporary does not equal worldly. Those are two totally different things. Some contemporary music might be worldly, uh, but not all contemporary music is worldly. There's a lot of great newer worship music. And, you know, some people think that, you know, older people can't relate to newer music. And I, I beg to differ. I, I've seen packed churches around the country, mega churches, where they're singing a lot of newer music that is anointed by the Spirit of God. And you got older people, hands lifted to God, worshiping the Lord just like anybody else. Amen. And so you shouldn't be afraid to, to move forward. You shouldn't be afraid to incorporate newer worship music in your church. Now, can music become worldly or fleshly? I believe that it can. But I, I also believe that certain churches get written off as worldly certain, uh, uh, simply because it doesn't align with certain people's traditions. Not because the Bible writes them off, it's because people are writing them off. Because it's a different style or it's a different culture, some people will just automatically write them off. Can I just tell you something here tonight? Lights on or lights dim, let me tell you something, that will not determine whether or not God moves in a church. That's a perfect example of a tradition that people have used to create a standard of righteousness, and they'll use scriptures completely out of context to try to justify it. They'll quote things like, God is light and in him is no darkness. Okay, well, if you want to take things out of context, you should go to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16 that says that the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Amen? I'll preach in a church with the lights on. I'll preach in a church with the lights off. I'll preach in a church with the lights dimmed. I'll preach in a church that can't afford lights because Jesus isn't limited by your light bill. Jesus isn't limited by the, 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 the lights being dimmed down in a church building. God will move wherever the truth of the word of God is preached. I, I mean, can the church world today get their mind off of carnal thinking and get their eyes on Jesus? Get their eyes on reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, people will say God can't move in churches that lights are dimmed down. They're worldly. And those people are thinking, well, when lights are dimmed down, it's easier for me to worship because I don't feel as distracted by everything that's happening around me. And there's no difference between you worshiping in a church with their lights dimmed down or you praying in your prayer closet with the lights totally and completely turned off. 
God will move wherever there are hungry hearts, but so often we hold on to the way things were because we prefer the comfort of the familiar over the pain of necessary growth. I'll say that again tonight. So often we hold on to the way things always were because we prefer the comfort of the familiar over the pain of necessary growth. Sometimes it's painful to grow. Sometimes it's painful to move forward, but you got to keep moving forward. you got to do whatever it takes to reach the lost with the gospel. The most important question the church has to ask itself is, are we reaching the next generation? Now, what does worldly mean? Because, you know, oftentimes you'll hear that word put on a lot of uh, worship music. What is worldly music? Let me say this tonight, that it's not simply referring to things on this earth, but rather things that are influenced by the spirit of the world. We know that Satan is a prince of the power of the air, Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 2. He's a prince of the power of the air, and the spirit of the world is centered upon self, upon pleasure, greed, lust, ungodliness, immorality, rebellion, pride, carnality, etc. That's what the spirit of the world is. Is. First John chapter 2 and verse 15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so uh, contemporary music, that's not worldly. Worldly, when the Bible speaks of being worldly, it's speaking of the system of the world and the spirit of the world that is centered upon things that are not godly. Psalm chapter 100 and verse 4. Psalm chapter 100 verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Hallelujah. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now, I want to define the difference for you tonight between praise and worship. Praise is acknowledging and thanking God for the things he has done in your life. We, we offer praise to God as thanksgiving, uh, as we remember the wonderful works he has done. And, and really the word praise, it means to express warm approval or admiration. Whereas worship is something different. Although they are often grouped together, it wor worship, it goes beyond praise. W worship happens when you uh, apply great worth to something or someone. Praise, it should lead you to worship. In essence, we worship God not just for the things that he has done, but we worship him simply for who he is. Worship is a spiritual act that happens when your spirit connects with God's spirit. I believe that any time people walk into church, they should walk in church ready to worship. I believe that the, the, the worship leaders shouldn't have to do backflips on the stage just for you to enter into worship. Uh, you shouldn't, Greg shouldn't have to spin in circles. I mean, he'll do what he's got to do, but he, he shouldn't have to do that. I, I, I mean, you got to come in ready to worship God. I'm, I'm thankful that we got a worshiping church. I'm thankful that we got a church that comes in, not just a play church, but people come in to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 says this. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Or you could say, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Whenever you worship God, there should be a sense of reverence, a sense of awe. And, and usually you can tell when worship is truly worship because you'll sense that reverence. Jesus won't be your, your homeboy. Jesus will be your savior. <laughs> Jesus won't just be the, the man upstairs. He'll be your master. He'll be your Lord. There, there's got to be some reverence for the kingdom of God. There's got to be reverence and respect for the Lord. Now, I want to ask a question tonight. Can music become, can worship music specifically just become mystical? Sometimes I, my answer to that is yes. But sometimes I've heard music, specifically Christian music, that is just, in a sense, just mystical, but I don't really sense the presence of God. Mystical, I believe, is when somebody is seeking a spiritual experience, but it's not on the basis of truth. First John chapter 4 and verse 1 says that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. When we worship God, we got to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I love Psalm chapter 40 and verse 3. 
It says, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. When you got saved, God put a new song in your mouth. Before I got saved, I was singing a song that said, I think I'm losing it. I might be losing it. I just might lose. Am I losing my mind? I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. And I need a clue before I run out of time. I'm losing it. I'm losing it. I think I'm losing. I'm losing my mind. But now I'm singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I'm talking about the amazing grace of God. Now, can you give God a shout of praise? in this place hallelujah and although we know that christianity isn't a, a quote-unquote religion christianity is a relationship with jesus christ but it's the only real religion so-called religion that has a song book because when you enter into relationship with god you've now got a song to sing you've got a song the song of the redeemed you've got a song that not even, even the angels can sing a, a song of redemption a song of victory a song of deliverance Deliverance, a song of healing. He's put a new song in your mouth. Hallelujah. The Bible is filled with references to music and instruments. Psalms chapter 95, verses 1, and, 1 through 6. Psalm 95, verse 1 through 6. It says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a, a joyful noise to him and song. Aren't you thankful the Bible says a, a joyful noise and not a pleasant noise, not a, a beautiful noise? Make a, a joyful noise unto him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord of our maker. Hallelujah. Psalms chapter 96 and verse 9, it says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Hallelujah. That's worship. Sometimes when you enter into the presence of God, it will cause you to tremble in his presence. Worship the Lord. Bow down before him. Hallelujah. So what can worship music anointed by the Holy Spirit, what can it accomplish? What can music that is truly anointed by the Spirit of God, what can it accomplish? I believe, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I believe that when the Spirit of God is upon a song, that it will bring freedom in your heart. It can bring deliverance, salvation, healing, encouragement, refreshment, renewing, freedom from oppression. There is something that begins to happen when a song is anointed by the Spirit of God. Something begins to change when a song is anointed by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. You see that when David was playing the harp in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, it says, And so it was whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, the, the God, the Lord, allowed a uh, Spirit to come upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. And then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you're going through times of oppression, you ought to turn on some anointed worship music and just begin to worship the Lord. You might still be in it. You might still be in that prison, but you can worship God in the middle of it, and God can lift that oppression. The Bible says to put on the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. You, you don't praise God after he brings you out. You praise God before he brings you out, knowing that he's going to bring you out. And then once he brings you out, then you can praise the Lord even more. Hallelujah. You don't have to wait for the victory to give God praise. You don't have to wait for the deliverance to give God praise. God blesses is those who act in praise and worship in the middle of their trial, in the middle of their suffering, because that's an expression of faith. When you worship God, when you're in the middle of the fiery furnace, that's an expression of faith. When you praise God, when you don't know how your bill is going to be due, that's an expression of faith. Hallelujah. Now, there are some churches out there that do not believe in musical instruments in the church. Uh, 
A specific example is the Church of Christ, which is totally different than Church of God in Christ. Church of Christ do not believe that musical instruments should be used in the church, although some of those in the Church of Christ do, but largely as a whole, they will not allow musical instruments in the church. Now, let me say this, that that is specifically because of tradition. It has nothing to do with what the Bible says. Now, they would say that they don't see in the New Testament uh, scriptural examples of instruments, and I'm going to give you some uh, examples of instruments here uh, tonight. But first, I want to give you just in general some of the, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, different instruments that are spoken of in scripture. Number one, you see the, the shofar. The shofar, it was traditionally of either a, a ram or a goat horn, but it wasn't specifically used to play music, but it was to sound a signal through a series of, of long or short blasts. You know, the shofar is something that um, is one of those things where people, because it's been abused, um, you know, some in the church world believe that when you play the shofar, that literally you'll send down angels from heaven and you'll get victory in your life. Well, I believe that victory comes through the blood of Jesus. So the moment you got saved, the moment you place your faith in the cross, you've already gotten victory in whatever area of your life. But, you know, I, I remember the first time I went to Honduras, we had these large evangelistic services. And, and, you know, one of the purposes, when you study out the purpose of the shofar, one of the purposes of the shofar was to call to attention. And, and you know, we in Honduras, we sent out buses, probably 30 or 40 buses all over the place and brought people in for an outdoor evangelistic service. And I, I remember those two nights, powerful anointed services, poured down rain both nights. Nobody left, probably because we were the ones with the buses. But be that as it may. I remember somebody didn't think about that till now. I just got that revelation. But, you know, during the worship music, there was somebody that, was, that, that opened up the service with the shofar. And can I tell you something? It was powerful when that was happening. It wasn't done to, to, to give people victory over sin, but it, it's a biblical instrument. It's an instrument that's found in the Word of God. And, and going back to what we taught on last Sunday with, uh, with Jericho, the Lord said when he get around that seventh time, he said, I want the, the trumpets to sound. Hallelujah. Another instrument is cymbals. Uh, these instruments were used in, in noisy celebrations. You, you see in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 5, and David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres. Now, lyres were basically, they're not like some of the people you might know. Lyres, lyres were basically like a harp. It was just a, a smaller uh, version of it. So with songs and lyres and uh, uh, harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals, uh, Psalms chapter 150 and verse 5 says, praise him with sounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. And so here you're seeing some biblical examples of God using instruments as an expression of praise, an expression of worship. I, I love my, my, my Russian, Ukrainian friends. I, I've had many conversations with uh, some of them about uh, expressions of worship in church. And, and I, I bring up the verses that say, uh, sh uh, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. And oftentimes people will say, well, well that was their culture, but we have a different culture. Can I tell you something here tonight? The word of God doesn't conform to our culture. Our culture conforms to the word of God. And, and what you see is that it is a biblical expression of worship, which means that if somebody comes into your church and they clap or they worship God, that that should not be a forbidden expression of worship. And there are some churches I've been to. I remember one particular church I was preaching at in New York. I got excited. I said, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. There's probably 200 people there. And I looked at their faces, and they're all afraid to clap. And, and so one guy in the front row, he wouldn't clap all the way. He just went like this. And then I found out that one of the leaders from that church was there and that if somebody would have clapped in that congregation, my coordinator told me they would have been reprimanded by that individual in their church. I said, y'all look like a bunch of tamed lions. 
There should be an expression to worship. There should be an expression to praise God. You see in the Old Testament, you see trumpets. The Old Testament describes the priests using uh, silver silver trumpets. They were, they were crafted from a solid piece of beaten silver uh, to gather the Israelites together and to signal the breaking of a camp. And, and then these trumpets, like the shofar, uh, they didn't have a, a, a pitch-altering device, uh, so they were given in a, in a series of, 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 of long or short blasts. No, uh, Numbers chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, make two silver trumpets of hammered work. You shall make them and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. Now you also, you see trumpets also mentioned in the New Testament, most, most notably uh, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11 uh, and verse 15 and 16, uh, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven singing that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. Hallelujah. So trumpets weren't just an Old Testament thing. Trumpets are a New Testament thing. Now, another instrument, which we traditionally don't consider an instrument, but voices are also an instrument. Our, our, vo our vocal cords can create a wide range of pitches uh, and, and tones, and there are loads of Bible verses to choose from when it comes to, to singing. Here's, here's a couple, Acts chapter uh, 16, verse 25 and 26. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Hallelujah. Paul and Silas said, I'm not going to wait for God to deliver me from this prison cell before I give God praise. I'm going to praise God in the middle of this prison cell. The biggest mistake the devil made was putting Paul and Silas in the same cell because he already said where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Bible says they began to sing praises to God. That ground began to shake. Those prison doors flung open wide, and they were freed by the power of God. Hallelujah. You ought to give God praise in the middle of your prison. You ought to give God praise even when you're in the pit. You see, reed pipes, which was a, a, a wood wind instrument that were often used in celebrations. You see that in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39 and 40. Uh, there, Zodok, the priest, took the horn of the oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. For the sake of time, I'll hit on these briefly. You see the, the liar, which, again, uh, isn't a lot of politicians you see on the news networks, although they would qualify. But a liar is an ancient stringed instrument with at least seven or eight strings. It was, it was played to accompany singers and is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. You see uh, in Psalms, uh, Psalm 98 and verse 5, it says, Sing praises to the Lord with a liar. Have you sung praises to the Lord with any liars in your life? It's biblical. It's scriptural. Lord, help me. Where did that come from? <laughs> Praise the Lord with liars. Sing praises to the Lord with a liar, with a liar and the sound of melody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord with the liars. Some people say I won't go to church because they got hypocrites in the church. It's scriptural to sing with hypocrites. It's scriptural to sing with liars. Amen. I'm not singing for them. I'm singing for Jesus. Amen. Talk about taking a scripture out of context. Amen. And then you see the harp, similar to the lyre, but larger and with more strings. The harp was also played to support singers. And you see it in Psalm uh, 144 and verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp, I will play to you. Now you also, I want to jump forward to the New Testament because you see references uh, in, Pauline's, uh, in the Pauline epistles uh, to instruments. When, when Paul... When he uses musical instruments to illustrate his points, uh, many of you, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verses 7 and 8, uh, he used musical instruments to illustrate his point 
concerning edifying speech in the church. Now, when he mentions these instruments here, this would have been a perfect opportunity. If, if it was unscriptural and unbiblical to use musical instruments in our worship, this would have been a perfect opportunity for Paul to condemn uh, the use uh, of instruments. But on the contrary, he stated that the members of the church should produce uh, edifying, intelligible speech just as musical instruments such as harps and flutes and trumpets should produce clear, distinct notes and sounds. Now, Paul, he also tells the believers that at the, at the rapture, the great resurrection of the dead, at the return of, of Jesus Christ, that it will be announced by the trumpet. Hallelujah. That God is going to use a trumpet at the return of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's scriptural, it's biblical uh, to use instruments. You see musical instruments in the book of Revelation, the revelation uh, to John, which begins with a, a voice that sounded like a trumpet. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, you see uh, the four living creatures and the 24 elders playing the harps in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. And then you see the worshiping multitude around God's throne whose sound is like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder, which... Uh, resembles the sound of harpists playing their harps. You see that in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 2. And so the sound of musical instruments and songs is everywhere in eschatological worship before God. It's everywhere throughout the book of Revelation where they are worshiping David's royal son, Jesus Christ, sitting on his throne. It's biblical to worship God with instruments. It's biblical to use instruments instruments in our worship unto God. Hallelujah. It's scriptural. Hallelujah. God, he blesses the drummers. He blesses the guitarists. He blesses the bass player. He blesses the piano. He blesses the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. will take those instruments as, as we are led by the Spirit of God. He will anoint it to touch hearts and minister to lives. Some songs, as I mentioned, are simply a sermon with a melody uh, uh, like Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Can I tell you something? You can be singing that song right there, and that would, would be all it would take for somebody to reach out in faith and get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God, he uses worship. He uses praise. Now, here's a question for you tonight. Should worship leaders collaborate with secular artists? Should worship leaders, true God-called worship leaders, collaborate with secular artists? I'll say it like this. Personally, I'm not a fan of it. Oftentimes, it's done to boost the influence of a song, but in the process, you can lose the effectiveness of, a, of, of the song. You know, I, I think of one uh, particular popular uh, song that I, I hear on satellite radio, and I, I love uh, about 90% of the song. It's a great worship song, and, and, and then there's a part with the secular artists, the, uh, secular artists, and this is what it says. Beach house vibes maneuver the jet ski. Because I serve a God that parted the Red Sea. Multi-million dollar commercials for Pepsi, from food stamps to more ice than Gretzky. I don't got to talk. The Lord defends me. I watch them all fall for going against me because me and all my angels shot the devil up. Can I tell you something? When I heard that, I didn't feel closer to Jesus. I didn't feel closer to God. I, I, in and, and so when you try to collaborate sometimes, and I'm not saying that every collaboration in a song has to be somebody that's saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and, and a preacher of the gospel, but what I'm saying is that sometimes we got to be careful because the Bible says what fellowship does light have with darkness? Worship, it, it's, a, it's a reverent thing. 
Worship is something that should bring glory to God. Worship is something that should draw hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Worship, true worship, anointed by the Spirit of God, should not build up the flesh, but it should bring you closer to Jesus. You, you know, I cringe at some Christian music when I hear it. Um, there's a song that, you know, for me, before I got saved, I listened to a lot of rap music, and one of my friends had introduced me to a bunch of Christian rap music. Well, there was one particular song that said, uh, riding with my top back, listen to that Jesus music. <laughs> to me, that's somebody trying to be cool who's not actually cool, and that's not normal. I think you need to go get checked out. <laughs> riding with my top back, listen to that Jesus music. That ain't cool. I, you know, to me, when, when somebody you know, compromises in that sense, you know, because for me, when riding with my top bag, listening to that Jesus music. In other words, like, I, I want to I show people what's up. I want to show people uh, how cool I am. And, 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 you know, worship, it does, it shouldn't build up the flesh. It should build up our spirit. It should draw us closer to Jesus. Music that is anointed by the Spirit of God will build up our spirit, and it, it doesn't uh, build up the flesh. Now, some people think that God, he only uses southern gospel music. But you know what's interesting is that a lot of, in fact, if you look at the origin of a lot of southern gospel music, there is actually a lot of influence from secular artists that influence southern gospel music. And so whereas some people say, uh, I can't listen to contemporary or I can't listen to, to music that's more uh, casual, they might call it pop culture, uh, and, and they write off that music and they say, I'll only listen to Southern gospel. You got people on the other end of the spectrum that will say, I can't listen to Southern gospel music because it reminds me of before I got saved rock and roll music that I heard in the bar room. And so it just goes to show that God, he's so much bigger than all of that. He's so much bigger than culture. He's so much bigger uh, than John. He's so much bigger than what we consider to be normal. God, he's so much bigger than all. Of it. Is it leading hearts and lives closer to Jesus? Is it drawing hearts closer to the Lord? That's what it's all about. Hallelujah. And I believe that, that certain music can influence people differently depending upon their upbringing. So in some cases, some people would say, I can't listen to this music because it reminds me of this. And then other people who never came from that background, they got no clue what they're talking about. They just turn on the song and it blesses them and it encourages them in their walk with God. And I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord, uh, you can't listen to this and you can't listen to that. I believe that's where personal conviction comes in. I, I believe that's where we've got to be led by the Spirit of God. You got the Spirit of God, Spirit of God living inside of you. You don't have to call up a pastor or a preacher and say, hey, can I listen to this song? Can I listen to that song? No. You are a child of God. You got the Spirit of God living inside of you. If there is a song that doesn't bring glory to him, you'll know. If there is a song that God doesn't want you listening to, you'll feel convicted. You got the Holy Ghost within you. Hallelujah. I want you to be led by him. Amen? Amen. God, he's so much bigger than our traditions. He's so much bigger than the confines that we put him in. Biblical expressions of worship include shouting, dancing, clapping, running, leaping, singing, kneeling, jumping, laying prostrate before God. Those are all biblical expressions of worship. Hallelujah. I told you that story before of the woman that walked in the church. She came from a Baptist background, walked in the church. She saw people running around. She saw people dancing. She saw people jumping, shouting, clapping doing all that stuff, and she went up to the, the pastor after the service, and she said, I see people running around, I see people dancing, I see people jumping, I see people shouting, but I just don't see anywhere in Scripture where Jesus ever ran around, where Jesus ever danced, where Jesus ever jumped, and if Jesus didn't do it, then I don't think that we should do it either, and he said, you know what, woman, you're right. Jesus, he never ran around. Jesus never jumped. He never leaped. He never shouted. But everybody that he touched did. Hallelujah. When that man outside of the gate of the temple called Beautiful was lame for 40 years outside of that gate, the Bible says he was touched by the presence of God and he was leaping and jumping and praising God. Something happens when the Spirit of God begins to move. It moves people to shout. It moves people to dance. 
It moves people to worship. Something happens when the Holy Ghost moves. It moves you to worship God. It moves you to give God praise. Hallelujah. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry of Jerusalem, the Bible says the whole city was moved by his presence. You see, you can't come in contact with the presence of God and and it not change you, it not affect you. It will change how you worship. It will change how you praise. It will change how you shout. Hallelujah. Something happens when the Spirit of God moves. Something happens when Jesus shows up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's biblical to worship God. Psalm chapter 149, verse 3, it said, Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. You know, Brother Marty, he, he was talking about Abraham and Isaac. And it dawned on me, I believe it's Genesis chapter 22 and verse 5, that when God instructed Abraham to go up and lay down Isaac on the altar, he said, we're going up to worship, but we will come back to you. God told him, I want you to sacrifice your son. And Abraham, he called it worship. Why did he call it worship? Because when your faith is right, everything you do is worship. When your faith is right, giving is worship. When your faith is right, shouting is worship. When your faith is right, dancing is worship. When your faith is right, sacrifice is worship. Everything you do is worship unto God. Worship is so much more than singing a song. Worship ought to be your life. You ought to present yourself as a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's your reasonable worship. Hallelujah. I feel that tonight. You ought to live a life of worship. Glory to God. Psalm 103, in verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, in all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all of his benefits. Who forgives all of your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the the eagles. Bless the Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Singers and musicians can come back here tonight. Glory to God. Revelation 4 and verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of your reverence, of your awe. When the Spirit of God moves, it will bring you to a place of reverence. It will stir your soul. At times, it will lead you to tears. God, he wants to move in a deeper realm through worship in your life.